Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jean-Antoine Giraud, and I'm a neuroscientist working in Paris. And I'm very happy to welcome you to this um, uh, Fans Friday webinar, which is devoted today to the IBRA. Many of you may have questions uh, about IBRA, and we, we have uh, experts to um, uh, answer these questions, and also they will present um, what IBRA is. And so we have, uh, let me go briefly through our participants. Uh, we have um, uh, Professor Monica Di Luca, who is the current president of the European Brain uh, Council, which is uh, the organization which is a, a European-wide organization uh, which is actually uh, playing a key role in coordinating the IBRA project. And among the actions of the IBRA, uh, there is the creation of clusters, of health clusters, that, uh, and we will hear two presentations of these health clusters. Uh, the first one will be by uh, Sabine Hulterkor, who is uh, for, uh, working in, uh, in Munich at the Helmholtz Institute, where she's um, heading the um, uh, behavioral um, uh, component of the mask, German mask clinic. And she will tell you about um, uh, the cluster she is coordinating. And then we will have a presentation by Thilo van Eimeren, uh, who is from Köln, from Cologne in Germany and uh, who is working at the, the Department of Nuclear Medicine and the uh, Department of Neurology as well. And he will tell us about um, uh, his cluster on uh, imaging, coordinating and standardizing uh, imaging. So uh, just to remind you how this um, webinar works. So uh, we will hear the presentations of the various speakers and uh, um, then there will be plenty of time for uh, discussions and questions at the end. So you can uh, put your question in the Q&A um, uh, chat box uh, that uh, is appearing on your, on your screen. And we, we will uh, ask the questions for the, to the speakers at the end. So without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Monica Di Luca, who will tell us about the EBC and about the IBRA in general. Please, Monica. Thank you very much, Jean-Antoine, for your kind invitation. Let me share my screen so that I can show my slides and my presentation. Um, I am Monica Di Luca, as uh, Jean-Antoine alluded to. I am a neuroscientist, a basic scientist placed at the University of Milano. And I'm very pleased to be here and discussing with all of you the importance of collaboration in the brain research area uh, in Europe and globally. And to discuss this important point today, I would like to bring two issues to all of you. First of all, I will allude to the actions and uh, what is the European Brain Council, because maybe not all of you are acquainted with this organization. And uh, as second, I will discuss with you the main topic of our webinar today, which is uh, the gross line of this uh, European project, which is called the European Brain Research Area that, as Jean-Antoine alluded to, is coordinated by European Brain Council and is mainly dealing with the importance of coordination and collaboration in the frame of brain science and neuroscience in Europe. Uh, let me use this opportunity to share with you a few slides on what European Brain Council is. European Brain Council is an umbrella organization that has been funded already more than 20 years ago. And I'm very proud to say as basic scientists that FENCE was one of the founding members of this important umbrella organization. And this organization has been generated merging at the same table all the scientific and professional societies with an interest on the brain in Europe. So we are dealing with basic scientists, clinical scientists, but we include in this important table also a representative of the private sector like industries, representative of the uh, member state like national brain councils, and more importantly, Above all, we have merging at the same table the two main uh, patients organizations that are acting in Europe, EFNA, European Federation of Neurological Association, and Gamian for psychiatric and mental health patients. So as you 
is a very large umbrella organization that encompass all the interest in brain research in Europe. And the main reason why already 20 years ago, we decided to generate this umbrella organization was mainly and clearly with a core mission in our head that was to promote brain research and brain health in Europe to improve prevention, diagnosis, therapy and care and improve the quality of life of those citizens which are living with brain disorders in Europe. Just in few words and in a nutshell, European Brain Council has been generated to act as an advocacy, as a strong advocacy organization to promote and to advocate for brain research in Europe. And of course, we had some main actions area. We, first of all, we decided to promote, and this is not trivial, the dialogue between all our member organizations. So between scientists, clinicians, patients, industry, and more important, the society, to foster the cooperation among all these member organizations with a clear aim to advocate for brain research as a single voice, as a one voice, raising awareness and promoting the education in the brain, disseminating the information about brain research, about the success of brain research in Europe, and the importance of tackling brain diseases in Europe. And of course, the main goal was to interact with our policymakers. So the idea was to, to act as a single voice, as a single important interlocutor with European Commission primarily, European Parliament, but also more recently with other relevant international institution at a global level, just to compare our activity in Europe and worldwide. Um, so these are our main mission. And I just would like to give you a few examples today because I believe it's important to know how European Brain Council act in Europe. And basically, the, one of the main goal was to uh, produce data and produce position papers that will, were all multi-stakeholder papers. So were addressed at the same time by basic scientists, clinician scientists, patients, industries, all together to promote the production of this uh, position paper to show the importance and the case and to showcase the relevance of continuous support for brain research in Europe. And the way we decided originally already 10 years ago to showcase this importance, I do apologize, was because we wanted to show the numbers uh, of brain diseases in Europe. First of all, we show already in 2010, which could be the cost of brain disorders in Europe, both psychiatric, mental health, and neurological all together. And we show an important aspect. This cost is amounting, is accounting at uh, approximately 800 billion euros, and this is every year. And this is an incredible amount of cost that accounts for direct and indirect cost. And sooner, if we do not act, this is going to become unaffordable for our society. So this is a clear point on how to support relevant research in the brain space, in the brain area. And coupled to this incredible number, we also have been able to show that in Europe, we have 179 million of citizens that are living or experiencing brain disorders in their life. This is again, an incredible number because this means one out of three which are set to live with one within their late lifespan with one brain disorder, mental or neurological alive. And uh, we really uh, have been followed up by many other organizations in showcasing the importance of brain research and the importance of tackling this phenomenal challenge that are brain diseases in Europe. Also by WHO that in 2017, echo us showing that the biggest number of years lost due to disability in Europe at European level are given by neurological and psychiatric disorders. So a challenge is out there. And in, in uh, European Brain Council, we were perfectly conscious about this challenge. So we decided to set our core activities just to advocate brain research in Europe with 
European institution with international institution just to uh, tackle every time the importance of supporting brain research. And of course, one of the pillar of our activity, which is of course, the political outreach has been maybe the most important for all of us in all these years and took us all the, the time, the, the vast majority of our time working at the European Brain Council together with all our member states. What do we do? It's not only producing um, position paper that could help not only societies, individual to advocate for brain science at national level, at European level, at international level. But we also took the advantage of being a single voice for brain research in Europe to advocate for brain research to European institution. I'm sure that most of you are aware of the fact that we are dealing with a new framework program in these days, which is called Horizon Europe. The framework program in Europe are of fundamental importance for all of us because this is meaning funds. This is meaning support for brain research. And of course, we have been particularly um, lucky or maybe not lucky, but successful in the seven framework program that maybe the, uh, some of you may remember in which a brain research was uh, design was uh, uh, highlighted by the European Commission and the European Parliament as a priority. And we continuously fight also with Horizon 2020 and now in Horizon Europe to defend and support the presence of brain research in Europe. So most of the activity of the last couple of years were defined to struggle to get brain research sufficiently highlighted inside the horizon Europe. First of all, we decided to join forces to defend the overall budget for health clusters in which uh, brain research is depicted, has its niche, and we have been quite successful also to join forces with other health organizations advocating for health science in Europe. So this was one important aspect. We defended a lot also the funds uh, with continuous meetings uh, with European Research Council, with the Commission, with the Parliament. We defended a lot of basic science to uh, defend the budget for ERC. That was, uh, of course, for us, one very important aspect. And again, we succeeded in keeping the level of the budget for basic science quite high. And we defended the fact, and this is not trivial, it's a very political uh, battle, but we have been able to uh, defend the fact that brain research could be included in many of the areas of intervention in the health cluster of uh, Horizon Europe. So we have been able to um, include brain research in uh, this particular area of intervention, which is health throughout the life course and in non-communicable and uh, rare disease, but also partly in environmental and social health determinants. So there are many ways in which now thanks to the efforts of everybody, of all the members of ABC, of the Council of ABC, uh, brain research is now depicted in, uh, in Horizon Europe. And I'm sure that maybe uh, some of you have noticed that uh, already in the first call, there were calls dedicated to mental health, to the neurobiology of mental health. And this is really because of the strong attitude of advocacy of this council. Um, we fed into all public Horizon Europe consultation. And we uh, took part of non-public consultation on the first draft uh, of the work program for the health cluster. So we have been continuously active and we still are in defending the position of brain research. And this is again, and I want to stress this because we are strongly convinced of the importance of the continuous and holistic support for basic research to tackle the major challenge of the next decade that will be for sure uh, curing or preventing brain disorders and curbing the number that I just showed you, the cost and the number of patients, which are 
in my opinion, a sort of a thinking bomb for all member states in Europe is really becoming uh, unaffordable. Um, more recently, we decided to take part in a discussion to uh, avoid the fragmentation of the support for brain research inside the second part of Horizon Europe. Maybe some of you knows that Horizon Europe is spanning seven years. We are now discussing only the first part of Horizon Europe, the first two or three years, but what we are the major battle now is to have a brain health priority or partnership of all membership together for the second half of Horizon Europe. And in fact, what we are trying to deal and discuss and negotiating with the European Commission and the European Parliament is really to improve the alignment and the synergies across brain disease research initiative inside all the membership, member state, to minimize um, time to market of prevention and treatments, intensifying scientific collaboration, identifying gaps in knowledge, improving data sharing, and facilitating access to infrastructure in the space of brain research. And this should convey inside a very important action inside uh, Horizon Europe, which is called the Brain Health Partnership. This is gonna be a great successful overview, very important um, achievement. And we really hope uh, to get this through in the second half of Horizon Europe. It's like having back a sort of a priority for brain research and the recognition of the importance of research that we all did in the area of the brain science and brain research in all these years to tackle one of the major challenges of the future. And I have to say that this brings me very easily to discuss about Debra, because Ebra is really in line for all these activities, uh, discussing the importance of alignment and avoiding fragmentation inside uh, European brain science funding in Europe. So let me uh, show you briefly what EBRA is. Um, as uh, Jean-Antoine Giraud alluded at the beginning, EBRA is really reflecting the importance of collaboration and cooperation in the area of brain research in Europe, because uh, it's already two years ago that the European Brain Council took the liberty to reply to a call of Horizon Europe that was asking to merge together at the same table all the major large initiatives that in Europe are at the moment funding brain research. So the funds of brain research in Europe are not coming solely from the European uh, pro work program, Horizon 2020, now Horizon Europe, previously the seven framework program. But there are also large initiatives like JPND uh, that was more targeted to neurodegenerative disorder, um, Aranet Neuron and the Human Brain Project that all together in a different ways, they fund, they support brain research collecting also and aligning, aligning the strategies of different member states. So it's like a cooperation, a collaboration with different member states that decide to align their own effort also economically and financially to a strategical aspect of research. So in EBC, we decided to join forces with all these partners and to generate this project that is called ABRA, and ABRA, the, the, the main, the conceptual framework of ABRA has been since the beginning to create connection within all these aspects of funding brain research in Europe, all similarly important for all of us to avoid the fragmentation also for our scientists, for individuals that need to tackle and to look in the different scenario of funding brain research for their own interest in the different member states at European level. And finally, with a very important goal that is to define shared priorities in our field, in the field of neuroscience, 
for the next future. And you can see that this is really reflecting the idea of the brain and partnership that I was alluding to you before, and that should be included in the second part of Horizon Europe. So we focus this project that is uh, with all these partners that I alluded and coordinated by European Brain Council and to focus at two different levels. One, if you wish, is more strategic. And with this strategic level, we decided to foster the alignment and to achieve a better coordination of research strategies across European brain initiatives. And the second one that, if you wish, is more operational, because we wanted really to support research communities in specific brain research areas. And these are the clusters that you will hear about very soon by my, from my colleagues, and to try to foster even more the networking activities and to avoid the fragmentation in specific uh, research communities in Europe. So in terms of activities, ABRA is uh, supporting these two levels, the strategic level and the more operational level. First of all, we wanted to do, I wanted really to uh, show you results of two important strategic activities and then I let the floor to the cluster. The first very important strategic activity was a sort of a landscape analysis. And the landscape analysis that we conducted and soon will be public because finally the European Commission allow us to make public this deliverable. Uh, we took into consideration all the project of the seven framework program, Horizon 2020, Aeronet and Neuron, JPND and Human Brain Project that were devoted to brain research. So we made a careful analysis of all these funding elements, and particularly for the seven framework program and Horizon 2020, we have been able to sort out from the whole project funded in Europe, those that were dedicated to neuroscience. And we come up with a number that is quite huge, is 3,584, I still remember, because it's a, a remarkable number of projects that are dealing with brain research involving clinician all over Europe and um, even private sector all over Europe because the framework program, as you know, is also involved with private sector partners. And these projects are uh, have been mapped. And now we generated a database of these projects and you can dig and navigate this database in many different ways. So now we have an idea on where funds went in a span time of 15 years. Because each framework program uh, lasts for seven years. So as you know, now we are discussing 70, 15 years of funds in, in neuroscience. This is a way of analyzing the mapping results, but we may have several other ways. This is in terms of diseases. You may see that maybe dementia has been one of the uh, most funded area, but, but we can really analyze the mapping landscape in many different ways by countries, by uh, you know categories, uh, animal models, or technologies, enabling technologies, whatever you wish. We can really have an idea of where funding went in the last fifteen years. And a second way uh, to analyze strategically uh, the 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 brain area space in in Europe was to try to get share priorities, as I alluded to you before. And this was also um, in our mind to, to generate a sort of a framework to guide the investment of principal European institution in for future brain research. So the idea was always to promote basic translational and clinical research, to enable innovation, to improve the life of citizens, to address the challenge that I alluded to you before, but Frankly speaking, what we wanted to achieve is try to avoid fragmentation and generate a common streamline that was absolutely the results of an open consultation with all the major stakeholders. And in fact, to do so, we already analyzed the existing brain research agendas because each of these large initiatives already had 
a strategic research agenda. You may be acquainted and maybe for curiosity, you may uh, go around into the, the, the web and found the internet neuron strategic agenda, JPND strategic agenda and others. So we put all those together and we uh, send the results of the merging of this and the analysis of these pre-existing brain research agendas uh, to uh, experts. Experts that have been uh, absolutely indicated by all the members of EBC. So they are representing basic science, clinical science, patients organization, private sector, so all together. And we ask to this expert whether they agree with these priorities that are already um, included there in all the, in the merging of the pre-existing agendas, or maybe they could identify and suggest us some gaps. So the idea was to identify priori existing priorities and possible gaps. And we made a sort of two-way back and forth with the expert for the survey. We ran a workshop. And now we are in the phase in which we already drafted this shared agenda uh, with the shared priorities uh, with the open consultation that will be very soon with the relevant stakeholders. So uh, we really hope that by the next few months and um, basically by April, we will deliver these shared priorities in Europe for the future. And we really hope that this will be fundamental and instrumental for the European institution to generate the brain and partnership and the future. We will promote also at a global level and confront ourselves with what is already existing and going on um, outside Europe. There are many different initiatives on the brain. I would like to use my last two minutes to discuss you the operational level. So these are two, the mapping and the shared priorities are really important strategic element. But one idea was also to support research community. And to do so, we decided to identify research community that may profit from further coordination, to expand the community, engage with stakeholder, build consensus on different topics or aspect in their research field, connect with research infrastructure, or simply increase the visibility of a particular field. So we run different calls. And I have to say that we had a very strong application, very important application. But unfortunately, we could support uh, only six clusters. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time because these are very important clusters, all of them that you may see here. But two of them are here in presence. So they, I don't want to use their time. And they will discuss, uh, they will discuss with us the importance of being part of this ABRA project that means collaboration, networking, cooperation, identify important priorities for the future. Again, in all the project, there is important aspect that is patient engagement that is reflected throughout, is reflected in the governance, is reflected at the strategic level, is reflected also in the cluster, in the communication and in the dissemination. So from my side, this is all. I really hope that I could give you just a clamped idea on what ABC is doing and the importance of EBRA, of cooperation and collaboration. And I leave the floor to the clusters now. Thank you very much, Ron Antoine. It's back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, for this very clear presentation. Uh, just perhaps one very small question before uh, I, um, uh, Samin talks is uh, you, you talked about the, um, the landscape uh, analysis that you did and you said it will be published soon. Do you have an idea of the um, uh, time frame of, for publication? I really hope it's going to be by the end of the month because we got okay. a goal from the European Commission and uh, now the, the, the only um, detail is how we can make it available because we will public, publish on the European uh, Brain Council website and the EBRA website, but we also would like to make it dynamic in okay. a sense that you can navigate yourself. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so um, now it is the turn to uh, Sabine Hulterkor to present us the um, 
uh, the, the cluster she's coordinating on predictive model system. So please, Sabine. Thank you very much. Um, could you just let me know if you can see my screen? Yes, clearly. Super. Thank you very much, Monica, also for your brilliant, vivid introduction of EBC and, and, and Ibra. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. So thank you very much for having me and uh, for giving me the, the opportunity to introduce the PREMOS cluster to you. PREMOS stands for Predictive Model Systems, and our goal is to increase the translational value of preclinical models in neuropsychiatry. Now, translation from basic scientific insights to improve therapeutic approaches for the benefit of patients lags behind in, in many disease areas, but it has been particularly difficult in this field during the last two decades. So we are working on a strategy to ensure that studies in preclinical models become more useful for the translation of results to human patients. And since this is a big task that requires collaboration in the PREMOS cluster, which is coordinated by myself and Jan Ero, three consortia have joined forces, InfraFrontier, which is a European research infrastructure, and the two IMI or Innovative Medicine Initiative funded European consortia, PRISM and EQIPT. So InfraFrontier consists of the European mouse clinic partners of the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium and InfraFrontier offers several resources and services related to mouse mutants, for example, access to 8,000 mutant mouse lines, the archiving or re-derivation of mouse lines, production and phenotyping of specific mouse lines, as well as training and consultation and a knowledge base on several disease areas. So InfraFrontier is a European consortium that is part of a larger international consortium, the International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium, IMPC. And IMPC has just celebrated its 10 year anniversary. The IMPC is a globally distributed research infrastructure that consists of 20 mouse production and phenotyping centers worldwide that together share the task of generating and phenotyping one knockout mouse line for every protein coding gene in the mouse genome that has a human author lock. And today, the comprehensive phenotyping data of 7,824 lines is already freely available to the scientific community from the IMPC website, mousephenotype.org, which you can see displayed here at the bottom of the slide. This data is an unmatched resource to find out which genetic loss of function effects that contribute to neuropsychiatric diseases in humans are conserved in mice. For behavioral and neurological assessments, neurobiology-based validated functional in vivo readouts are used, but IMPC does not only perform behavioral and neurological assessments, but applies a comprehensive phenotyping pipeline that addresses all body systems so that the IMPC data is strategically placed to identify the genetic relation between psychiatric and shared medical comorbidities. The mice are on a single genetic background, which has the advantage in comparison to human genome-wide association studies that small effects of genetic loss of function become more easily detectable. The phenotyping starts in early adulthood, which might be ideal to pick up genetically caused alterations of brain development that play a role in many neurodevelopmental diseases. IMPC data might be particularly advantageous for rare disrupting mutations for which only limited patient cohorts exist. A couple of years ago, Binaz Yaltsin and her colleagues analyzed the male mice of 1,566 IMPC lines according to 118 neuroanatomical parameters that they de defined. And um, they identified almost 200 genes whose disruption caused neuroanatomical phenotypes, most of them affecting structures that are implicated in brain connectivity. 17% of the human orthologs of these genes are known loci for cognitive dysfunction in humans, so that the remaining 83% are genes that are newly implicated in brain architecture. 
Such analyses of the IMPC data sets offer complementary information to human genetic studies and enable a detailed species comparison that could be very helpful for translational research. And that relates directly to the topic of this webinar, because when I joined Helmholtz Munich 20 years ago to contribute to the establishment of the German mouse clinic and those large scale consortia that later became the IMPC, I doubted at the time that I would see the translation of my work for the benefit of patients during my professional career. I thought it was too much basic research that we were doing and the task was just too big. Today, we register the genes for which we have mouse lines with interesting phenotypes in an app called GeneMatcher. GeneMatcher brings together clinicians and preclinical researchers that share an interest in the same gene. And through this app, we get contacted by clinicians who have patients with mutations in these genes. And then we can start to work together to find out if our comprehensive phenotyping results can in any way be helpful for the treatment of the patients or if additional analyses or a more specific mouse line are needed. So through this, coordinated collaborative large-scale effort, I've personally come closer to translation of my work than I ever thought possible two decades ago. Back to Premos. The second Premos partner is the PRISM Consortium. And PRISM complements the infrafrontier perspective as it comes from the patient side, but also works on solutions for neurobiology-related reasons of previous translational failures. It is coordinated by Martin Kahrs from Groningen, and the project leader is Hugh Marston from Böhringer Ingelheim. PRISM consists of clinicians and neurobiologists with deep knowledge of the brain and its development, who implemented homologous quantitative biological parameters in clinical and preclinical studies with a focus on domains that are affected transdiagnostically with respect to schizophrenia and Alzheimer's disease, for example, the domains of sensory processing or social behavior. PRISM will back-translate human findings to animal studies to develop predictive model systems as an important step to validate underlying mechanistic concepts and for future testing of therapeutic approaches. PRISM 2 is the second funding period during which the PRISM team determines the reproducibility of their findings from the first funding period of compromised integrity of those brain circuits that shape human social behavior. And they will test the generalizability of these findings to major depressive disorder and also pursue the previously mentioned back translations of these brain circuit disturbances to animal models. The third premise partner is EQIPT, which stands for European or more recently for enhancing quality in preclinical data. And EQIPT is led by Malcolm McLeod and Thomas Steckler. EQIPT creates solutions for data quality related reasons for translational failures and has identified in detail the things that can go wrong with respect to the quality of preclinical data during experimental design, performance, documentation, training of experimenters, and data analysis and interpretation. To remedy this problem, EKIP developed simple sustainable solutions in the form of um, a quality system that they also train, for example, via a specifically developed online training platform. Equipped also audits and certifies labs, for example, the German mouse clinic is already equipped uh, certified. And um, the equipped quality system has less demands than, for example, an ISO 9001 or DLP certification and is therefore implementable also in smaller labs. So the bottom line here is equipped already developed a strategy how to remedy the preclinical data quality problem. And while there is admittedly still a long way to go to implement this strategy on a large scale, at least the tools are already there. The main objective of PREMOS is to reach a broad consensus on a strategy to improve the predictive value of preclinical models in neuropsychiatry. Um, and we try to move all stakeholders with us along the way. 
the achievement of this objective would also contribute to a reduction of the number of animals needed in preclinical research, as the, the key goal in this field is, field is to develop better cures for patients, and animal models are only a part of that when they are necessary because they cannot be replaced by alternative methods. And at present, there are no alternative methods for the analysis of complex behaviors. Cellular systems, organs on a chip or organoids cannot model complex behaviors or the entire physiology of an intact living organism, nor can they be simulated and regulators still insist on preclinical in vivo studies in model organisms to assess new therapeutic approaches. PREMOS is supported by IBRA since the beginning of February this year until October next year. And during that time, we carry out several activities. Initially, we surveyed our cluster members, what they considered to be the main translational gaps, which we discussed in detail in three workgroup meetings. We also specifically addressed clinicians and asked them what their requirements are to consider animal models as clinically relevant. And the main answers we got were symptom similarity and similar responses to drugs between the models used and humans. Clinicians and industry partners also considered the investigation of genetic contributions to neuropsychiatric diseases a valuable approach and advocated for a staggered use of different model systems to optimize the predictive validity of preclinical studies. We reached an internal consensus that for the foreseeable future, we will continue to rely on animal models because to treat a disease, we need to understand the mechanism in a complex organism and that we need to ensure that biologically, biologically conserved mechanisms are investigated that are relevant for the diseases under study and that preclinical data quality measures need to be implemented on a large scale. We will discuss our positions with all interested stakeholders in our following activity, the stakeholder meeting, which is planned for February or March next year. And if you're interested to get involved, please get in touch with us via Ebra. The mail address is displayed at the bottom of this slide. Um, the stakeholder meeting will also include patient representatives, and we will include all views and feedback for our last activity, the consensus meeting. And that's it for the Premos cluster. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sabine, for your presentation. It's very um, uh, wonderful to see how much you've been already able to achieve in, the, in this very important area. And uh, I will uh, now we will, uh, give the floor to uh, Tilo van Eimeren, who will talk to us about a different, very important aspect, both basic and translational, which is the the, the development of uh, biomarkers using brain imaging techniques. So please, Tilo, if you can share your screen. Um, we see I'm your slides, but we, we, see, we don't see the full screen um, yet. We see only the, yeah, perfect. Thank you very That's much. That's it, okay. Thank you, thank you so much, um, uh, jean Antoine. And um, uh, I'm, I'm, I have the pleasure to talk about our cluster, which is the European cluster for imaging biomarkers. So this is a collaborative alliance of uh, European researchers in the field of brain imaging. And we share uh, the same goal, which is to uh, unlock the full potential of brain imaging technologies for the benefit of science, but also of patients. Um, if you think about it, brain imaging uh, is really a vast field. It's a, a dynamically evolving field. Um, uh, and, and this uh, relates to really new technologies that, that we see all the time, uh, brand new technologies uh, every, every year. But uh, there's also uh, development uh, with older technologies uh, pushing towards uh, big data and uh, other approaches. Um, and these uh, approaches all together um, can inform us about uh, generally human brain states um, and how the brain works in, in health, but also, of course, um, how diseases come about and uh, which pathways are involved and uh, what are the mechanisms of uh, these uh, sometimes very dreadful diseases that we already heard about by Monica. 
Um, and of course, in the clinical practice, we uh, use brain imaging technologies all the time as very powerful diagnostic instruments. Um, but we think that uh, we can uh, do much more in integrating uh, research into the clinical domain. Um, and that is to detect brain diseases or classify brain diseases. In other words, making or establishing a diagnosis, but also to predict the outcome, for example, or to make a prognosis uh, or to predict the outcome of a, 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 of a therapeutic intervention, um, but also ultimately potentially to be used as a surrogate endpoint in clinical trials. And we've seen that just recently with the adecanumab um, uh, approval in, in the US where for the first time very debated, but um, for the first time, uh, an imaging biomarker has been used um, uh, as a surrogate endpoint uh, to, to, uh, to allow uh, a, a therapy against uh, amyloid in, uh, in Alzheimer's disease. So that, that is uh, highly debated, but it's uh, something that we probably will see much more. But we also have to look at the gaps and, and needs. Um, how can we develop that field? How can we uh, move on and, um, and push forward? Of course, we need harmonization. We need harmonization of the data collection and, and brain imaging, and, and particularly for the multi-centric uh, data collection. Um, and that's, uh, that's a challenge uh, on, on many, many levels um, uh, that I'm not going to go into detail about. But also we need to talk about uh, how can we enable data sharing uh, off, uh, uh, off, uh, so outside of the technical aspects. Um, and that's more pertaining to the legal aspects and the data safety and, uh, and protection uh, aspects. And how can we promote open science, um, which is, of course, embraced by scientists usually, but has uh, particularly particular challenges or limitations that, that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, and I think, or we think, that we also need to build infrastructure for, for that uh, European infrastructure that can, um, uh, that can uh, guide or that can pr uh, pr purvey information. So it could be information platforms, for example, on data sharing, but could also and has to probably be uh, platforms uh, for data sharing in a very practical sense. So uh, a platform that can provide safe and adequate um, uh, data transfer and data sharing and something like repositories for open science um, that also um, will help and push the field in that direction. And ICIP, the European Cluster for Imaging uh, Biomarkers is really now weaving together uh, consortia platforms and networks uh, on the European level. Uh, and as Monica um, alluded to, uh, from the different funding mechanisms bringing all these groups together to talk about these issues. And this is just a uh, you know, very busy slide. I'm, I'm, my apologies for that, but this is the current state of the members. Uh, and as you can see here, there are a lot of groups and projects involved from different European funding mechanisms. And these are complemented by uh, European networks, uh, sorry, uh, single state networks, so uh, national networks. Uh, that already have a lot of experience in data sharing uh, with uh, data, sh uh, data sharing with brain imaging, um, and uh, and this is uh, still open to other uh, additions. So if you're interested, please um, uh, to call out to Ibra, um, and uh, we will we will get in touch. Um, so what are we planning to do within this period, let's say, of uh, Ibra funding? What we uh, plan to do is to give a unique um, researcher's perspective on the challenges and the chances, but also the limitations of sharing brain imaging data, uh, particularly big uh, data approaches uh, within the 
constraints of, uh, constraints of uh, GDPR, but also uh, highlighting open science approaches. Uh, and we uh, started this discussion a couple of months ago on how, what, what kind of uh, issues, what kind of questions do we want to address for this. Uh, we also delineated or uh, had a or now have a list of uh, or a survey that we uh, that we have finalized, and this survey uh, uh, will con contain uh, most of the questions that you can see in this cloud here. Uh, so the FAIR principles, for example, which uh, helps reusability of data uh, will be addressed, but also uh, some data storage standards like the BITS uh, standard, and also issues around the data protection and personal uh, personalized data or anonymization of data, um, particularly uh, important for big data. Uh, and most of uh, the other questions will revolve around uh, open science and what are the, the incentive schemes that could help promoting open science and or what are the challenges and, and the hurdles there. So this is finalized now, we'll go out to the participants and the way we will do that is we will, um, um, uh, the, the PIs of the networks or the projects that we've just seen, will provide this um, survey to all the members of the different projects. So in total, we will have about 150 to 200 PIs that are on European level um, projects involved there. So already successful uh, with European projects. So we will get the uh, very specific viewpoint of these researchers. Uh, and the idea is that we can now find a consensus, which we will hopefully do with um, uh, an in-person meeting in Brussels next year, probably in March. Uh, and then of course, we want to uh, uh, provide the uh, stakeholders and the decision makers with that viewpoints or with these viewpoints in a position paper that may help in guiding the framework uh, that is useful uh, uh, to push uh, forward this this field and and that's already what I wanted to say and I'm happy to discuss uh, anything related to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tilo, for this uh, presentation of the, this also wonderful coordination project. Um, so I will I will um, there are a number of uh, questions from the participants. So I will forward them to you. So I, I will perhaps start with um, uh, and I will summarize the question, of course. Uh, so uh, with, with um, perhaps a question more for Monica, but perhaps the uh, the others have uh, also a word to say about that, is about the, um, uh, the country limitation of this vision. So we uh, obviously, EBRA is oriented towards the European Union countries, but there were questions about the participation of, uh, I, and I would put it at two levels, perhaps, uh, European countries, uh, geographically European countries, which are not or no longer members of the European Union. That's one thing. And second, what about beyond Euro Europe? Like, for example, uh, partnerships with and funding pot potentially uh, with uh, Asian partners. Right? There was a question about that. Can you, would you like to comment on that, Monica? I can, I can certainly comment. Uh, I start to comment on this. Uh, first of all, uh, in terms of EBRA, of course, we were discussing, if, we, if, I mean, if you talk about the Brain Health Partnership, then you need to talk about Europe in terms of political Europe. But of course, the contribution of EBRA and the open consultation will be a sort of non-geographic Europe where science has no borders. We always said it in France and in all our other member organization of, of EBC. So the open consultation will be the open consultation. My real, real hope is that we can produce some documents out of EBRA that can be then conveyed to the different member states or the different countries, let's put it this way, to convince the politician, the policymaker country-wise to highlight and put very high brain research in their political agenda. If they are a member of Europe, if they are not a member of Europe, doesn't matter in my eyes uh, at the end of the day. But what, I, what we really need is to try to climb a little bit 
this political agenda in the different countries to highlight the importance of brain research. This is extremely important. And in terms of uh, collaborating and having a vision outside Europe in terms of uh, uh, global uh, activities, I have to say that TBC together with FENCE, Jean-Antoine did already a lot uh, because for example, we organized in FENCE forum uh, last time when it was virtual, unfortunately, uh, a very large debate on comparing the activities that we are running to advocate for brain research and initiative in brain research in Europe. And we uh, compare with uh, uh, other initiatives worldwide, with the Asian, with the Chinese, with the US. And very recently, for example, we organized together with the STOA, that is the Scientific and Technological Committee of the European Parliament and the IBI, which is the International Brain Initiative, a, um, an event at European Parliament in which we uh, opened a dialogue with all these initiatives worldwide. It was extremely interesting. We had the Canadian initiative, the Asian initiative, we have the, the Chinese, we had the, the Americans. We had really, it was really an open worldwide discussion on the importance of raising and promoting brain initiative worldwide. I think that this is a win-win situation because the goal is really to raise the awareness on this aspect that has been not neglected, but the attention has been fragmented in okay. all the world. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, would uh, either Sabine or Tilo want to uh, add um, uh, something specific to their uh, clusters uh, in relation to these um, questions about outside Europe? Yes, please, Sabine. Yeah, um, I mean, I can just comment, you know, to our English or UK partners who have been, well, leading the way to the IMPC, they are still Infra Frontier members um, and EMMA partners of the European Mouse Mutant Archive. And um, we have just started a new cost action to improve biomedical research by automated home, home cage monitoring. And the grant holder is our partner in, in the MRC Harwell. So that is still possible. Um, and I think in the... Horizon Europe program, um, there has been the possibility to also have um, partners in the US and Canada, I think, um, that were able to receive funding. And also the new NIH guidelines have changed in a way that there can also be um, NIH uh, projects with European partners that can also receive funding, which I think is a change to the past. Um, that's the part I know. Mm. Okay, thank, thank you. I can, I can we'll also maybe just, just very quickly add that we are extremely interested in, in interaction outside of the European countries. Um, of course, some of the aspects that we address particularly contain European aspects like the GDPR regulation, which is uh, more specific for, for Europe, but, um, but similar uh, Challenges or difficulties are also present in other countries. We also we are, we are um, very much in touch with the open uh, with the open Canadian network, so mm -hmm. our Canadian partners, uh, but also um, open science uh, approaches with brain imaging in the U.S., which are uh, led by Russell Podrack, for example. Um, so we're in touch with those um, groups, and um, I think we can integrate these uh, these um, advances. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, another question was about um, uh, infrastructures, uh, um, uh, informatics, and data management uh, infrastructures. So uh, which are important, I think, for uh, your uh, two clusters, perhaps even more so for the imaging one. So uh, what is the vision in the context of these um, uh, future projects for Europe? What will be uh, the support and the availability of such uh, infrastructures for the scientific community, uh, especially uh, related to, in that context, informatics and data uh, storing and, um, and, and managing? So perhaps, uh, Monica, you want to say a few yeah, general words I would about like it? To say then, uh, 
yeah. uh, I suppose Tilo is directly concerned with this. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, but I, I just issue. want to give the, the, the overview of, of, uh, of ABRA on infrastructure and data sharing. This is a very important aspect, and I'm very particularly grateful to our partners like uh, Aeronet Neuron and uh, Human Brain Project, JPND as well, but particularly Aaron and Neuron is organizing workshops that are dedicated to PIs and engaging with clusters as well, exactly to raise the awareness on data sharing, to promote a, a dialogue and to get information also not only to the very senior PI that are engaged with the cluster, but we are also trying to go to our young colleagues that is very important to reach in our opinion. So there will be workshop also open to younger uh, people. And I, I am very vocal on that because I really would like to have people applying to this workshop that are particularly important for infrastructure and sharing data, dedicated to young and also open to everybody. And uh, I think that this is also a step forward. I mean, it's sort of a educational process on how to share the infrastructure and be aware of the availability of common infrastructure at European level. But I'm sure that Tilo would like to add something yeah. that's more specific and Sabine as well. Huh? Yeah, maybe maybe very specific. So if, if, if uh, so for just a, an example, because we are engaged in Cologne with a, a multi-center uh, collection of data and providing also the infrastructure for that and the service for that. It's a small scale, so it's it's only a couple of thousand images, but it's not so. It's the same problems that everybody will face collecting the data, and the problems that we uh, that or the challenges that we have there are not unique, and it could be solved on a on a or in an exemplary way on a European uh, basis. So, how can we actually receive anonymous data? They have to be anonymous when they get to us. How is that uh, done with uh, brain images, for example? What is the role of defacing, for example? Because you can re reconstruct theoretically from an MRI, you can reconstruct the face so you can contain that information because it's personal, personalized information. So those are the technical aspects to that, but there are also legal aspects to that. We have to go through all the legal procedures with all the different partners, which is really a challenge. So uh, anything that uh, the European Union can do on that level to help us um, harmonizing the legal aspects of that, uh, but also, and then on the technical side, maybe a platform uh, that, that we use, for example, a lot of the times is XNET. So it's very challenging to host imaging data, which are complex together with non-imaging data in the same sphere. And the only solutions that are, let's say, out there are also, again, American solutions and sometimes licensed. So it could, could also be, uh, there could also be a European solution for that, uh, that is a little bit more elegant, I would say, that, that XNAT is at the point. So um, I think those are the two aspects that I would highlight, help on the side of the legal issues, the administrative issues, and the technical issues could be centralized in a kind of a central European service. Sabine, would you like to add something? Or? Um, I, I, I can only add a small part because our data has been largely non-imaging data. Um, and um, as you've seen, the mouse phenotype uh, data is, is hosted by the European Bioinformatics Institute. And I mean, they have a tremendous experience in, in setting up these platforms and um, dealing with this data and also providing all sorts of tools. Um, I'm, I'm not involved in any discussions about imaging data, so I don't want to uh, so, no, no, but Sabina, the, 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 the data on, on animals, for example, the genetic molecular data yeah. are also extremely important. And the fact that yeah. you're using this common platform is fundamental. Yeah, and it's yeah. already there and it's all fair already. Exactly. You, can, uh, you can already download it all. So there are yeah. tons of solutions for these kinds of data. And um, yeah. I would say yeah. the EBI... Um, has been extremely no, helpful in this way. Yeah. 
I think part of the question was uh, not only on the way to share data, as you um, uh, clearly um, uh, mentioned, but also on the physical uh, facilities for storing the data. And uh, uh, are there any, um, could you tell us about any either ongoing project or projects for uh, later on uh, related to these uh, common infrastructures and, uh, for, uh, and perhaps um, eBrain, which is uh, um, the, the follow-up of uh, HBP, if I may say so, uh, uh, would contribute to that? Uh, for sure, for sure. eBrains is, uh, as you know, the evolution, I will call it, of uh, the Human Brain Project. is now an active partner of uh, the uh, Ebra Project, and they jumped in, and they are uh, extremely collaborative, and I'm sure that their role on infrastructure would be of tremendous help. Maybe it's impacting a little bit more on imaging data on uh, Tilo can, can tell us a little bit more about that, but uh, th their help is fundamental. So also uh, the, the, the people who are mainly uh, responsible for eBrains also uh, part of our cluster. So exactly. that, that would be helpful. Um, and and as there's some other aspects that we that we didn't talk about, which I find very important. Uh, that is, if you if you think about um, the the research that is going to be done in in the field in in a couple of years, if under the umbrella under the premise of open science, then um, then uh, of course there there is a little bit of a new mismatch then between data collection and publication, because in theory, of course. People can then collect data, which in clinical in the clinical domain is really really hard to to get by these uh, this data, uh, and then the currency for uh, research typically is publication. But if you have this this mismatch uh, or, or the, the 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 chasm basically between data collection and then publication, anybody can then use the data and publish, which is great. Of course, for the for the for the future of science, but uh, we have to think of and discuss uh, about the uh, about maybe a new currency that is linked to the data collection and how that could be organized. I think that is that would be really push open science much more. Mm -hmm. Extremely important. Yeah, important. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, no, a very different topic which was raised is about uh, patient engagement and uh, and patient engagement strategy. So this is perhaps more related to directly to imaging. So can you tell us about uh, you know how uh, patients are uh, uh, actively participating in the in the in the networks and especially in this one and others and um, uh, how is it um, implemented somehow? So we have a lot of uh, projects that are part of the cluster, which uh, directly implement patient organizations in the governing of the project, so in the uh, uh, project line out. Um, for this particular, uh, for these, for the um, action that we now do within EPRA, uh, the patient aspect is a little bit more limited because we want to provide the unique researchers perspective, as I said. So that's a very specific project, and that is not uh, rep doesn't represent our general view on the importance of uh, integrating patient uh, organizations. That's very important. But as we, our goal in this particular action is to provide the specific researchers' perspective, that is a little bit outside of the uh, imminent uh, project. But we plan to integrate or to uh, invite uh, um, stakeholders and patient representatives also to our meeting to discuss with them uh, what our yeah what our viewpoints are and uh, and that's going to going to be very important i think but if i may add of course yes. this is intrinsic into abra uh, characteristic as you know uh, very well jean antoine we have a patient's organization inside ebc mm. and we have patient representative and they are strongly engaged also in the governance of ebra itself in the program steering committee we have a patient's organization which is representing us and this is very important because they are uh, 
in the decision process, in the decision making process of the selection of clusters, of the discussion of the importance also of the activity of cluster, patients are engaged since the beginning. So it is intrinsic uh, in the activity of cluster, the patient's engagement, because it comes ex ante, we say in Italy. I mean, they come beforehand, right? So they choose and they negotiate with us which can be the direction uh, that the cluster should take and that they know very well that we negotiate very heavily what they should do and what they should not do inside the frame of ABRA. For us, the concept of it is something absolutely important that we learned in the starting from the seven framework program, so it's already more than 15 years that we learn how to work together with patients since the beginning. <coughs> and also in Ebra, this is what reflected, yeah. and automatically in the clusters. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, Monica. Uh, a very different question for uh, Mota, for Sabine is um, so about model systems. So, uh, as you uh, clearly explain, um, uh, uh, studies with animals are, are uh, very much needed because uh, they are the only ones to answer questions in, in many specific fields. But uh, you talk mostly about the mouse, but there are other model systems ranging from uh, C. elegans or uh, Drosophila uh, to non-human primates. So I was wondering whether uh, your network uh, is also integrating other model systems besides the mouse, and how do you see, uh, uh, are there connections in the, uh, to your knowledge in these areas as well? So the Premos cluster is uh, hoping to um get in touch with uh, representatives uh, of, or stakeholders um, who really represent also the research in, into other model systems because there, there is a clear um, focus on, on mouse research within our cluster already, but the, um, um, also the clinicians who um, are involved in, in PRISM, um, for example, also work with other model systems or in the PRIME study. Um, and it is clear that um, the use of different model systems, um, not only animal models, um, but also organoids um, might be um, very advantageous at different steps of the translational process. And we would like to have all stakeholders' views for our final um, output, for our final consensus meeting. So it would be great if they could all get in touch with us and basically um, represent um, their views themselves. Okay, so perhaps this is a call for the uh, audience, so the participants, if among the participants there Absolutely. are um, uh, scientists involved uh, in research in other model systems, you, you should uh, definitely be in touch with uh, uh, the Premos network. Uh, um, th there is uh, another point which was raised well by one of the participants, which is not really a question, more uh, like a suggestion, and I, I will try to uh, summarize it. Uh, the, the question was, it's a complicated to collaborate and to organize things together, but would it be possible to have like a general um, a big organization, including uh, um, uh, representative of scientists, eminent scientists, who which could be in charge of uh, doing all this coordination. So does it, uh, of, of course, it sounds great, but uh, do you think it is realistically possible? I mean, you've been moving forward towards a lot of synergies and lots of coordination. And do you see, how do you see we can go beyond that? If, if, if it is appropriate. The idea, the idea to go beyond is then to um, organize, and this is something I really would like to do at the end of Ebra, uh, is last conference and before that we would like to put together all the clusters not only those uh, who succeeded in the selection but everybody applied because if they had an interest in ABRA it means that they had a, a strong push towards coordination and collaboration in Europe and they were absolutely all excellence but, but we had to do a selection so the general idea is putting together all the different um, aspect of neuroscience and uh, communities of neuroscience and try to 
um, discuss the possibility of an over hierarchical uh, organization and collaboration that can go also beyond the era itself. Mm. And this is, in, to my eyes, extremely important. We mobilize the community and would I, we would like to keep the community together. Mm. Okay. Not easy, but possible. So, um... Then I, I perhaps turn to the um, uh, technical organization uh, of the, our this webinar. I think we are reaching the the end. So uh, should we uh, um, stop now? Uh, there are many questions. I mean, uh, you are raising a, a lot of uh, absolutely uh, important questions, but also you are what is wonderful is you are bringing solutions to that, and you are implementing things which are really working well in Europe which are putting in contact people in different countries, institutes, centers, and, and uh, experts in different countries together. And that really uh, has a synergistic effect for uh, uh, solving major issues, which were uh, outlined at the beginning of the, um, of the webinar by uh, Monica in terms of uh, health burden, because this is obviously one of the main um, objectives together is ultimately to uh, be very useful for the European uh, population and beyond, of course. So I think we will uh, um, uh, stop here. And I, I would like to thank very much the, the participants of today. Uh, first of all, our speakers and uh, also the, all the uh, participants in the webinars were raised a very interesting questions. And um, I hope they will follow up interacting uh, with the um, organizers and uh, of these uh, various clusters and there are many others which would not be discussed uh, today but there are other clusters that you may uh, have the opportunity to discover on the website thank you very much and i would thank like you. to say um, goodbye to everybody and have a wonderful time and wonderful holidays as well for yeah. the end of the year thank you, thank you very too. much thank you. thank you all thank you for very everything. much thank very you. nice it was a pleasure bye -bye. discussion it was a pleasure bye bye, bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.